Where am I? I suppose it has been a few years since I uploaded a video, and nobody's been watching The Void in that time. I guess it got bigger. You guys remember The Void, right? It showed up in the background of one of my videos, and it was frankly unsettling, but it was good for visuals, so I decided to keep it around. Anyway, I should probably figure out how to fix things. At the very least, get out of here. Maybe this mystery powder that seems to be everywhere will help me figure it out. Hey, that gives me an idea. While I try to figure out what to do about all of this, I can tell you guys about spectroscopy. For those of you who are new here, I'm Peter, and I call myself the 20-something chemist. Or at least I did. There's been some rebranding on the channel, and this is now something that I'm calling the Chemist's Codex. I talk about chemistry, and comics, and movies, and Dungeons and & Dragons, and whatever else might catch my interest, so if any of that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss when I upload. Anyway, are you guys familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum? Yeah, that thing. It's the spectrum on which light exists, and on one end you have the low energy radio waves, and on the other end you have the high energy gamma rays. Well, each part of the electromagnetic spectrum can interact with matter in different ways. See, when we shoot light at something, it can excite molecules or atoms or even parts of an atom into a different higher energy level. And when we measure the amount of energy associated with that excitation, or the amount of energy coming off of a sample, we can learn something about the material, and that's basically what spectroscopy is. We shoot light at a sample, or measure the amount of light coming off, and see what we can learn. So we can potentially use spectroscopy to learn something about this mystery powder that seems to be everywhere. And I want to give a brief disclaimer here that the spectra that I'm going to show are simulated spectra, they are not real pieces of data, so there might be errors or inconsistencies with actual experimentally given also, this is by no means a complete overview of spectroscopy as a topic. I'm just going over some of the more common techniques that someone might encounter. And it gives me a chance to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. So, let's get started on the left side of the spectrum with radio waves. The type of spectroscopy associated with radio waves is called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR. Now see, the nucleus of an atom has something called an intrinsic magnetic moment meaning it can act as a sort of bar magnet. And normally these magnetic moments are oriented completely randomly. But if we apply an external magnetic field to a sample, those magnetic moments will either align with or against the magnetic field. This separates nuclei into two energy states, a lower one aligned with the magnetic field and a higher one aligned against the magnetic field. And if we shoot some radio waves at it at the right frequency, we can excite atoms from that lower energy state into the higher one. The exact amount of energy needed for that will depend on the identity of the atom and the surrounding atoms. I'm not going to get into too many details about how it works because I don't want to bore you more than I already am, but essentially the amount of energy required to excite one of the atoms, the energy that creates that gap is going to depend on the amount of electrons around an atom. Now, since NMR probes the nucleus of an atom, the type of NMR you do will depend on what atom you're trying to look at. The most common being hydrogen, typically referred to as proton NMR, or carbon-13 NMR. And since those are the most common types, NMR is very commonly used to look at organic materials. Now, an interesting thing about NMR is that it actually uses the same basic principles as an MRI machine. Or rather, an MRI machine uses the same basic principles as NMR. So when you get an MRI scan, it's just using an external magnetic field to align the magnetic moments of the atoms in your body, and then using radio waves to create an image of your organs. So let's see if we can learn anything about our mystery powder using NMR. Hey Void, can you run a proton NMR of this powder for me? Yeah, in all honesty, it's been a while since I've done any NMR, so I'm probably not going to be able to get much out of this right now. But if you look at that peak over there, that's a good indication that we're dealing with a carboxylic acid. So that's something. Moving on to the next part of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have microwaves. Now, I'm going to assume most of you are at least somewhat familiar with microwaves, since you probably have a microwave oven in your kitchen. And 
microwave ovens cook food by exciting molecules into higher energy states, so they move more, so they generate friction, which produces heat and thus cooks your food. So microwaves can excite molecules to different rotational energy levels. And unfortunately, there's probably not much information that we're going to be able to get out of microwave spectroscopy in this case, since it is primarily used on gas molecules, which our mystery powder clearly isn't. Although, an application of microwave spectroscopy that I think is really cool is using it to identify molecules in clouds of gas in space. See, it shouldn't be a shock to anyone that space is really cold, and there's this interesting property of temperature and population of energy levels where the colder a temperature is, the less likely those higher energy levels are actually going to have any molecules in them. So in space, it's cold enough that pretty much only rotational energy levels are going to have any sort of significant population. And molecules in those higher energy levels can decay back to the ground state emitting microwaves, which we can then detect with a microwave telescope and make a microwave spectrum to identify what molecule actually created that microwave and determine the composition of this cloud of gas in space. And the main pieces of information that are useful from a microwave spectrum are the moments of inertia and the rotational constants. The moments of inertia are used to determine things like bond angles in molecules, and the rotational constants can help determine the moments of inertia. And both of those can also help identify basic symmetry of the molecule. Although, I just got an idea. I could just ask the void where this... Where did this bag come from? Hey void, did you give me this plastic bag? Well, I guess the void can make things. That's helpful. Can you tell me what this is? Why not? But you do know what this substance is. Oh, cool. The void knows how to play coy. That's fun. Well, we might as well move on. The next part of the electromagnetic spectrum is infrared, or IR. Now, IR spectroscopy, like with others, will excite molecules to different energy levels, but this time we're looking at vibrations. So a chemical bond can be thought of as a spring with the bond kind of oscillating back and forth at different speeds depending on what atoms the bond is made with. So when we excite molecules to different vibrational levels, the vibrations will be at different frequencies based on these atoms and we can actually identify these different chemical groups based on those frequencies. And there are different types of vibrations that can occur. There's stretching and there's bending, with stretching being either extending or compressing a bond and bending being changing the bond angle itself. Using water as an example, there's a symmetric stretch where the bonds are moving in and out at the same time. There's an asymmetric stretch where one bond is moving in while the other bond is moving out. And then there's a bending vibration, typically referred to as a scissor mode, where both bonds are moving closer together and then moving farther apart. And as molecules get more complex, they'll have even crazier looking vibrational modes. And they'll all vibrate at different-ish frequencies from each other. But we can distinguish the actual chemical groups from one another using IR spectroscopy. So, let's take a look at the IR spectrum for our mystery substance. Void, would you? Okay, so this is marginally helpful. I can tell from this peak here that we are dealing with a carbonyl, and that peak over there does seem to indicate that we have a hydroxyl group, which is consistent with what I said about having a carboxylic acid, so we didn't really learn much. But let's keep moving. So moving on to the next region of the electromagnetic spectrum, or rather regions, since this next spectroscopy uses two, we have UV-Vis spectroscopy, which is the ultraviolet and visible regions, hence the name. Now, this time around, we're looking at electronic transitions within molecules. I assume most of you have at least heard the term electron orbitals. They're the general area around an atom where electrons are most likely to be found. Well, molecules have molecular orbitals as well. The main difference, though, is that molecular orbitals can technically exist without electrons actually in them. In any molecule, there are these things called frontier orbitals, the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital or HOMO and LUMO. In simpler terms, they're the highest energy molecular orbital with electrons in it, and the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital without any electrons in it. 
So UV vis spectroscopy excites an electron from the HOMO into the LUMO, and we can measure how much light is absorbed and determine the concentration of a compound in a sample. Although this typically involves measuring a bunch of known concentrations to create a calibration curve that you can then use to calculate the unknown concentration, which is something I can't really do. Unless... Hey, Void, since you probably already know what this stuff is, can you give me a calibration curve that it can use to determine an unknown concentration? Is it because whatever this thing is doesn't absorb in the UV vis region? Okay, then. That is, unfortunately, one of the limitations of UV vis spectroscopy. If your compound doesn't absorb in that region, it doesn't really help. But understanding how molecules absorb UV and visible light is still important. A prime example of that is sunscreen. See, there are different types of UV light that are what's referred to as ionizing radiation, where it can actually strip molecules of their electrons. And this can be harmful because it can damage your DNA if you get too much sun exposure. And that's what sunscreen does. It absorbs light in those specific regions to help protect your skin. Moving on to the next region of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have X-rays. Now, there are a lot of different things you can do with x-rays, not all of them being spectroscopy. And even the ones that are spectroscopy are still fairly numerous. So to keep things simple for this video, I'm only going to be talking about one of those techniques. But if there's interest in me talking about all the different things you can do with x-rays, I would be more than happy to make that video. So let me know in the comments down below. The type of spectroscopy I'm going to be talking about today is called x-ray fluorescence, or XRF. See, like with UV vis, X-rays will still excite electrons, but they excite core electrons, the ones that are beneath the outermost layer of electrons, which are called valence electrons. When we hit an atom with an X-ray, we will excite one of those electrons out of the atom, and it will leave behind a hole that then gets filled by one of the electrons in a higher energy orbital, falling back down to fill it, which then emits another X-ray, which we can measure, and that X-ray is characteristic to the atom and the specific orbital transition that occurred. Now, one cool application of XRF that I kind of like is in archeology. span There are handheld XRF analyzers that can be brought out into the field and used to look at the elemental composition of artifacts, which is very nice because XRF is a non-destructive technique, so it leaves the sample intact. And archeologists can use that data to then determine or at least help determine where an artifact was made, if it matches the surrounding landscape composition, or if it matches something that's miles away. And this means that we can potentially use XRF to look at the elemental composition of our mystery compound. Void, if you would. Okay, so looking at this, it looks like our compound is 60% oxygen and 40% carbon, roughly speaking. And I do want to give a disclaimer here that typically carbon and oxygen don't really work that well with XRF since the X-ray energies associated with those transitions are fairly weak and you might not get enough intensity to actually measure it. But for the sake of this video, this is what we're doing. Another important thing to note is that there is no peak for hydrogen. But we know hydrogen is in the sample since earlier I did a proton NMR of the mystery powder and that has to have hydrogen to do so but we don't have hydrogen on the XRF because there's no core electrons in hydrogen. It only has one electron. There's nothing beneath it except the nucleus. And now the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we haven't talked about yet is gamma rays. And this is probably going to be a pretty brief section since gamma spectroscopy is typically used to look at radioactive isotopes. See, different radioisotopes will emit gamma photons at different characteristic energies. And we can measure the amount of photons coming off of the sample plot their energies, and determine what isotopes are actually present in a sample. However, I don't think that's going to be helpful here, especially since we know our sample is mostly carbon and oxygen, which aren't particularly radioactive to begin with, and I also doubt the void would put me in a place that is radioactive. Am I right, void? You wouldn't put me in a space with a bunch of radioactive material, right? Okay, that's mildly concerning. Either way, I'm like 95% sure our sample is not radioactive. Let's call it 90%. So with all of that information, I should be able to identify our mystery powder, right? Well, kind of. I know a couple of the functional groups. I know we probably have a carboxylic acid. And with the NMR, in theory, I should be able to determine a structure. But 
I'm Rusty and I don't have my textbooks with me. The main thing that would help me out here is knowing this substance's molar mass, but there's not really a spectroscopic technique to identify that. The closest thing would be mass spectrometry, which is distinctly different. See, mass spectrometry involves ionizing a molecule, typically in a way that gets it to fragment, and then separating those ions and fragments by mass. Still very helpful, but not technically spectroscopy because we're not shooting it with light. So, Void, can you tell me the molar mass of this stuff so I can figure out what it is? It's not usually a good idea to eat mysterious substances that may or may not be radioactive. And if I refuse... That's actually kind of a valid point. Okay, one second. And here we go, tasting our mysterious substance. Is that just malic acid? Why is there malic acid all over the place? Great, so this gives me no information on how to get out of here or how to fix things. I guess that brings us to the close of this video. I did simplify a lot of things. I gave more of a broad overview of spectroscopy, kind of talking about the more common things that you might encounter. So if anyone wants me to go more in depth on any of the things I mentioned or talk about something I didn't mention, let me know in the comments and I will gladly talk about it. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not already and I will see you in the next video. In the meantime, I'm going to go explore the void and see if I can actually learn anything.